Hey everyone, I think 70 participants is probably a great number to start with, and I expect other colleagues will join. Um, so very quickly, you might know me as Lisa, who for many of you will just be the person who starts these calls. Um, Lisa from the Global Protection Cluster. I see that some of you have started to introduce yourselves in the chat. That is great. Please keep going. Um, I think Mukhtar, you're the latest, to, so welcome. Um, look, let's just get on with things. Angelika has come to join us today to talk about strengthening protection analysis and planning, uh, particularly engaging local actors and communities in these protection analyses. Um, I hope you have a great session. And so over to you. Hi, everyone. Hi, Liza. Thanks a lot for supporting the facilitation of this session. Um, as Lisa mentioned, my name is Angeliki. I work for IRC. I am the Senior Protection Analysis Specialist. Thank you for joining today's session on engaging local organizations in protection analysis processes. Um, I will present with Mark Mabemba, who is the Project Manager with Inclusion International, David Salem Salem Hattar, who is the Protection Cluster Coordinator in South Sudan, and Addis Victor, the executive director for Access for Social yeah, Inclusion, um, based yeah, in, so in South Sudan. So Could I ask colleagues to mute yeah, their mics, let's please? Let's go. Please be here. But here, please. Yeah. Colleagues, can you please mute your mics? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, so I would like to quickly go through the agenda items for today's session. Um, we are going to present um, on localizing protection analysis uh, capacities project. We're going to share some learnings and some of the recommendations. Um, Mark from Inclusion International will present on inclusive and accessible protection analysis processes and we'll share with you concrete recommendations on how to make sure that we create inclusive spaces and to encourage equal participation. Uh, and then we're going to hear from David and Addis on concrete examples, good practices from um, the engagement of local actors and actors with this, working with people with disabilities in South Sudan during the drafting of the thematic POW last year. Uh, we're going to close with a session on um, Q and A's and reflections from your side. And I would really like to encourage you all to share your feedback, your inputs, your comments, uh, even questions in the chat or at the end of the session. I, I might not be able to follow like the chat while I present, but I will get back to you shortly after the session if any of your questions haven't been um, answered. Um, okay, moving on with the objectives uh, of the session. So the objectives of our session today focus on meaningful engagement of local actors and their communities in analysis processes at the cluster level, but beyond the cluster as well. Uh, during the session, we want to better understand challenges and gaps related to the engagement of local actors in protection analysis processes. We would like to share with you and introduce the resources we have developed to enable um, local organizations to meaningfully participate and contribute to protection analysis. Um, we'd like to share some concrete um, uh, actions and way forward when it comes to um, protection analysis, inclusiveness and accessibility, especially for uh, organizations working with people with disabilities and uh, organizations working with other marginalized groups. Um, and we want to share good practices and learnings from South Sudan and reflect on how we can integrate some of these recommendations in the HPC uh, process. Uh, most importantly, this is a space to reflect on common challenges and really brainstorm on collective actions, taking into consideration operational gaps and bottlenecks so we could encourage uh, active um, participation and interaction. So we really want to hear from you. Um, feel free to, to share your experiences, but also feel free to question us. And um, I really wish we have like a, a meaningful and fruitful conversation, which will 
uh, help us uh, take collective actions and improve protection analysis uh, processes. So why are we having this session and uh, what drove us here? Uh, over the last years, significant progress has been made by international organizations and coordination fora to use evidence-based uh, programming to support critical decision-making and humanitarian responses. Although protection risk analysis and the use of the protection analysis framework has played a significant role in shaping priorities and understanding the protection environment. And one of the great examples is the um, drafting of the protection analysis updates and the efforts to ensure harmonization of practices and use of the findings to inform HNO and HRP processes. However, at the same time, um, very often the role of local actors and their unique understanding of risks uh, and available capacities at community level is overlooked. Uh, so we do want to uh, give emphasis on how we can make protection analysis more inclusive to local organizations and civil society. And we really want to um, create spaces where voices of marginalized communities and marginalized groups uh, will be raised. So from one hand, how do we engage with local actors, but also amongst local actors, we do have organizations, activist groups who focus on specific risks, who have expertise working with specific groups of people who have been um, systematically marginalized. Therefore, and as part of the CEDA funded project, Localizing Protection Analysis Capacities for Impact, IRC worked in coordination with other organizations and in particular Inclusion International uh, and a broader network of international and local actors to share learnings and recommendations and focus on good practices on how to effectively include and utilize the knowledge and expertise of local organizations in protection analysis processes in order to interpret contextual nuances, strengthen views and priorities of affected communities and to represent groups of people who have been marginalized from decision making. So IRC in consultation with the Information um, Analysis Working Group under the GPC, identified as one of the main challenges that prevents local actors to engage meaningfully, the lack of accessible resources and tools uh, that allow organizations and communities to better understand and report threats and uh, the impact of those threats on uh, conflict affected, displacement affected communities. So between 2022 and 2024, March 2024, CEDA funded IRC to work on ensuring that protection analysis is based on contextual uh, knowledge and expertise and that existing resources such as the protection analysis framework um, are accessible to diverse audience and frontline staff who have uh, a very important role to play in the analysis processes. Given that frontline staff often come from affected communities and they are very close to the communities themselves, uh, they have a better understanding of risks, uh, they have a better understanding of priorities, they have a better understanding of available capacities at local and community level. So the project targeted uh, South Sudan, Nigeria and Northeast Syria and focused on building local capacities, skills and knowledge uh, and um, encouraging local contributions to protection analysis uh, as well as encouraging meaningful participation in decision making when it comes to uh, prevention and response strategies at, uh, at cluster level uh, as well at, as at community and, and local level. And this led us to the PATH adaptation process, the protection analysis framework adaptation process. So how we worked, um, so building on the protection analysis framework um, in uh, 2023, IRC partnered with Inclusion International and through a series of outreach activities, we established an advisory group of 10 local and representative organizations coming from a diverse um, background and expertise, including organizations of people with disabilities, women and refugee-led organizations, LGBTIQ plus activist groups, and organizations working with elderly people. 
So our first objective was to invite local actors and create an inclusive and accessible spa space and then uh, encourage them and allow them to lead the development of the resources. So they really needed to feel empowered as part of this process and also guide us through what was needed, what was the priority and how the resources that we had um, published and they have been endorsed by the Global Protection Cluster, the PATH, uh, was accessible and inclusive and could actually be used by frontline staff, local actors, communities in a meaningful manner. So the local advisory group had a clear TOR and a work plan that was co-developed, co-designed by the members of the group. And it has been adjusted during the project to accommodate members' needs and priorities. So the members of the group worked uh, for a period of over six months. Uh, they assessed uh, existing protection risk analysis resources, uh, mainly the protection analysis framework and a number of other um, resources that we have developed. Uh, they developed criteria to adjust the resources and worked on necessary adaptations throughout various channels. So IRC and Inclusion International facilitated a series of core uh, workshops. However, local actors worked in smaller groups, uh, online and offline, and interacted in various forms and occasions. Uh, Obviously, one of the biggest challenges was the language barrier as we engaged with colleagues from different language backgrounds, um, in particular Arabic and English. So we um, uh, made sure that there is interpretation available and translation of different resource packages. Uh, however, um, Translation of resources and feedback was also facilitated and supported by other members of the group who spoke both languages and undertook uh, that role to support uh, communication and easy access for, for other colleagues. So based on the um, consultations we had with the local advisory group, uh, a number of different like recommendations um, and sessions we hold with uh, the information analysis working group, as well as based on feedback and recommendations from the PATH Lessons Learned event. Uh, we focus on the adaptation of the protection analysis framework package, uh, and we use four main criteria uh, to look at the resources. So we looked at accessibility issues, we looked at inclusion issues, we looked at the relevance of the framework and the usability how uh, user-friendly basically the framework and the resource package is for local and representative actors. Uh, so the adapted resources addressed issues around conceptual clarity. So we reviewed um, the glossary, we elaborated on the terminology, we simplified the language, uh, we used the different icons uh, to give concrete examples or to further explain and simplify some of the concepts uh, as well as some of, the, some of the protection risks, the threats, the vulnerabilities, and the capacities. So we extensively use the CAR deck. So for those who are familiar with the protection analysis framework training package, there is um, a CAR deck with specific icons used to explain what we mean by the path pillars and sub pillars. Uh, and then we also uh, applied the path onto concrete examples and we tried to initiate protection analysis based on two scenarios uh, explaining the different steps of the protection analysis uh, process. So the resources target uh, protection and non-protection actors and they are available in three languages English, French and Arabic. They can be used to facilitate introductory trainings explain the different steps of the protection analysis process uh, and introduce key analytical questions in line with the path pillars which can be used by actors for like data collection but also to uh, for the to map the information landscape and better understand what are the information gaps in order to structure uh, their their analysis uh, so we have a powerpoint presentation we have the path uh, simplified version if you want, uh, and in addition to those resources, uh, with um, guidance by Inclusion International, 
we have also developed a list of uh, recommendations to ensure that protection analysis spaces are inclusive to people with intellectual disabilities, uh, which has been identified as a significant gap as there are no other resources or concrete examples uh, which create inclusive spaces for people with intellectual disabilities and allow them to meaningfully participate in uh, risk analysis. So the aim of the final uh, projects is to support local capacities for effective and inclusive protection analysis at national and local level and guide the creation of inclusive and more representative participation of local actors. Uh, and as I mentioned before, um, actors from different backgrounds um, who have worked with people with diverse zodiac, elderly people, uh, um, women-led organizations and activist groups have participated. Therefore, there are a lot of elements um, which uh, uh, affect protection risks targeting the specific groups or with a broader impact uh, for uh, marginalized and excluded uh, groups of affected communities. So the resources were developed and they have been shared with a broader group of actors for feedback. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they have been translated in Arabic and French uh, and they, they are available for uh, further dissemination. We have already developed a dissemination plan and some of you might have already received the resources, the resource packets, but we are very happy to share as part of, the, of this thematic session uh, together with the, the presentation. So apart from the resources, um, uh, one of the achievements of this project was also the creation of the network of local actors. So we managed to bring together a network of local organizations from different uh, groups and ask them to work together towards a common goal. So we tested different modalities and ways of working and we supported members in order to ensure that the virtual space we created is accessible to everyone. Uh, so everyone had the space to contribute and participate. Um, and the way we achieved that was through clear information on expectations, having very clear work plans, uh, TORs, um, uh, following a very inclusive and consultative process, uh, asking actors to be involved since the very beginning of the design uh, of the path adaptation process. We plan together, we design next steps, we prioritize which resources require to be adapted based on which criteria. Uh, and then we also ask local actors to lead this process. Uh, so from, uh, from our side, we had dedicated funding to compensate for their time and effort, uh, but we also managed to um, uh, offer some additional um, reasonable accommodations. We made sure that IRC offices in country operations were accessible and open for um, members who wanted to access the IRC offices and work from there. We made sure that reliable internet connections were available. So we really tried um, to accommodate different needs. So you can see on the slide feedback we received from uh, the actors who engage in this process. Uh, there are some elements which are quite important uh, to us, including the feelings of um, empowerment and inclusion, the fact that learning and multi-country experiences have a positive outcome. Um, colleagues from different uh, backgrounds, different contexts, they came together and they really shared and enriched their experiences by sharing learnings, challenges, gaps, but also um, uh, jointly brainstorming around uh, actions and way, ways forward. So by sharing this feedback, we really want to flag the direction that we would like to take uh, and think of strategies and actions which are serve into cross-learning, local actors empowerment, and analysis based on local knowledge, expertise, and, uh, and priorities coming from the communities coming from local organizations. Um, as part of the learning process, we have mapped a series of challenges and gaps that we would like to share with you. Uh, this is the result of consultations with our country programs, IRC partner organizations, local and representative actors. 
um, as well as other uh, international organizations uh, during the information analysis working group, but also other bilateral conversations we had with protection actors who engage in protection analysis initiatives. Um, so we have tried to group uh, and summarize some of the challenges, and then uh, this is followed by a list of recommendations we want to, to share. So there is a need for conceptual clarity and understanding of the protection analysis framework uh, use and the protection analysis as an ongoing process, which can fit into different system-wide initiatives, including the HNO, the HRPs. Um, Protection analysis framework is quite heavy. It's um, technically difficult uh, for some colleagues. It's challenging when it comes to uh, its use by local and national actors. And that refers mostly to the language, the language which is used. It's quite technical. The format um, is a bit complicated sometimes, the iconography, et cetera, which is something that we have tried to address with the adapted resources. So protection analysis is a time-consuming and resource-intensive process, which discards local actors from engaging in a meaningful manner. Um, not all organizations have the same level of skills, capacities, understanding, including technical skills and capacities, and information management uh, skills. Joint analysis processes um, are increasing. However, they do remain quite centralized. And usually local actors um, are only part of the data collection process um, and they rarely engage in the actual analysis of the information, the triangulation of the findings, the validation uh, of, the, um, of the conclusions and the development of the recommendations and the actions. Uh, based on these identified challenges and gaps, we have tried to put together a list of recommendations. Colleagues, mm -hmm. could you please mute your mics? Could you please mute your mics? I will, I will mute. Unfortunately, I will have to mute you. Uh, Lisa, can you please help me with muting colleagues? The high no, please mute your mic. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, based on the challenges that we have uh, identified, uh, we have tried to group a list of different recommendations and examples of good practices from protection analysis initiatives across different contexts. We have um, mainly focused on um, experiences and joint analysis with local actors um, based on feedback we received from uh, IRC's country programs, from partners' uh, feedback, um, as well as from other organizations we work together. Uh, so in South Sudan, um, and this is something that we will also discuss shortly, uh, the protection cluster has established a protection analysis task force to lead on the development of protection analysis projects. Uh, and there was a clear engagement of local organizations and uh, organizations working with people with disabilities. Um, clear TOR's division of roles and responsibilities based on expertise and interest might also help and current engagement of local organizations, dedicated resources and reasonable accommodations, such as access to physical spaces, equipment, reliable internet connection, different ways of working online and offline, interpretation and translation uh, might also be uh, useful um, uh, ways to engage with local organizations. Um, 
capacity building activities, regular support through mentoring and coaching sessions of local actors and representative organizations uh, are also very helpful and very much needed. Flexible, adaptable and harmonized tools and resources, uh, which could be easily adapted uh, based on the context, based on the priorities and based on the capacities on the ground. Uh, planning of joint analysis sessions in advance, engaging local actors from the very beginning of the process, uh, as well as organizations of workshops on risk prioritization and validation of findings involving local organizations at field level and then sharing um, input comments at national level. Uh, and also creation of uh, spaces for regular cross-learning led by local, local organizations to come up with suggestions with good examples and share good practices um, across different contexts. Hello. Okay. So we would like to share some good examples uh, of how these recommendations could be incorporated in the protection analysis process leading to the HNO. Uh, here is an outline of the different steps of the protection cluster analysis as outlined uh, in the recently published guidance note, which you could find online. So it is important to ensure uh, local and representative actors are involved across the different steps of the process. As I mentioned before, uh, based on uh, field level feedback, local actors are often engaged in data collection. Uh, however, they are not uh, actively involved in the analysis of the different information, the um, prioritization of the different risks affecting their communities, uh, and eventually the development of action plans uh, when it comes to risk reduction strategies. Uh, so clearly there are efforts and steps that should take place independently of this process. Uh, such steps include uh, further dissemination rollout of the adapted resources and the materials, capacity building and capacity strengthening activities, uh, simplification of tools, etc. However, uh, there, are, there, there is a number of recommendations which may align with the timeframes of the uh, GPC. Uh, uh, and looking at the timeline, we'd really like to uh, suggest the establishment of dedicated task teams and task forces uh, with assigned local organizations in each of the context to undertake pieces of the protection analysis. Uh, the planning and facilitation of joint analysis workshops um, involving local organizations to agree on risk prioritization based on field evidence and experience, experiences from frontline staff and community representatives. Uh, we can um, design action plans and concrete recommendations built on capacities identified by local entities and actors, and we can create spaces to engage civil society organizations, activist groups, to look at the recommendations, provide feedback, uh, and support validation of the different uh, analytical conclusions we come up with and support us with dissemination of findings um, in a safe and meaningful manner, depending obviously on the audience, depending on the context. Uh, so based on the above, uh, I would really like to ask for your feedback and input. So we uh, are going to share with you uh, Mentimeter. So I'm going to put in the chat the Mentimeter details. Uh, and I would like you to rate some of these recommendations. Um, thinking of uh, visibility uh, in your context. So we have two questions. One question is, how would you rank? Uh, these recommendations. And the second question is, what do you need uh, in order to implement some of these recommendations? So I will try to share the results. In the meantime, I hope you all have access to the Mentimeter. You can use the code I just um, put in the chat. So it's 63862907. 
and I'm going to share my screen. So this is the question. Just give me a second. Can you all see the Mentimeter? Can you see the question? Do you have access to the Mentimeter? Perfect. I already see some of the results. OK. Perfect. I hope this works. Great. So I can wait for some more like feedback from your side. Please feel free to rank the recommendations based on your experiences, based on what's feasible, what makes sense. So joint validation workshops of findings at field and local level comes first. OK. Things have just changed. So capacity building activities on protection analysis and the use of PATH is first now joint validation workshops, identification of protection analysis focal points, protection analysis task teams, is now fourth joint reflection sessions and joint risk prioritization workshops comes last okay a few more minutes because the the charts keep changing which is quite interesting Great, we have joint validation workshops first, then capacity building. The establishment of protection analysis task teams has now moved to the third uh, position. Fourth. OK, perfect. Please keep uh, ranking, keep sending and sharing feedback. This is very interesting. OK, in the interest of time, I think we can move to the next question, but the Menti will be open for the next few days. So please feel free to come back to to the um, to the Mentimeter and share your um, your inputs. So as of now, we have capacity building activities um, being ranked as the first kind of like recommendation, which is feasible and relevant, uh, establishment of protection analysis task teams, joint validation workshops, uh, identification of protection analysis focal points. OK, things are keep changing. Super interesting. Uh, let's discuss this ranking uh, during the Q&A session. So I would like to move to the next question. What do you need? So from your uh, side as um, protection cluster coordinators, co-coordinators, protection actors, local organization, what is needed in order to implement uh, some of these recommendations in your context? And this is the next slide. Sorry.
feel feel free to to share your thoughts. Uh, clearly, there are no right or wrong answers. So anything you write here, it's totally valid. Uh, and we just want to create a space to reflect and brainstorm together, but also um, get inspired by by your um, opinions, thoughts, good examples, good practices. Great. So I see guidelines, training resources, technical support for analysis process, session plans for workshops, leadership from local organization, a shift in mindset. That's always the first step. Time, funding, clearly. Key groups to include, excellent. Technical support for analysis process, capacity building, sharing resources, guidelines. Technical support. I would I would really love to hear more on what is needed, how we can better support, um, and I will I will try to reach out to to those who are interested because we would like to continue this conversation uh, and make sure that from our side uh, we are able to extend our support, our experiences um, with with all of you. Um, Thanks a lot for your feedback uh, and would like to move on with our next presenter. So I will give the floor to Mark and I will mute my mic. So Mark, over to you. Now, uh, I'll start my presentation. Uh, I'm introducing myself. Next slide. Uh, my name is Magma Bemba from Malawi. I'm a project manager at Inclusion International, and also I'm a self bogey a person with uh, intellectual disability. Who are we? Inclusion International is the international network of people with intellectual disabilities and their families. We have members in every region of the world. We have a small and big members, local, local, national, and regional organizations. Our four members are organizations of people with disabilities, and all our members are committed to inclusion and work on the lives of people with intellectual disabilities and their families. Next. Now, what do you mean by inclusion? People with intellectual disabilities are treated equally and respected for who they are in their families and in their communities. Barriers are removed so we can all take part in all community life. Everyone has the control it's over it's their it's and they can have the choices and make their own decisions. Everyone can use the many streams services. Any services which are separated or segregated, like special schools, day centers, or shattered workshops, are not inclusive. We believe that no one is too disabled to take part or to be included. Next. So, what do we do? One, advocacy. 
making sure a voice and the experiences of people with intellectual disabilities are heard at process where decisions are made, like at the United Nations. We give direct support to members through programs and projects, advice and shared learning. And lastly, we bring our members together to share their experience and work on key issues. Now, about the listening cool respect guidelines. Listening good respect is a set of guidelines and tools for organizations. They help organization organization of all types of types to be more inclusive of people with intellectual disabilities. The guideline in good practical advice and checklist to follow. They were created by our members and the members of Down Syndrome International. Next. Who contribute to the listening group respect uh, guidelines? So we had uh, 350 organizations from 100 countries, and more than 1,400 people took part in 60 inclusive consultations. So for therefore. Example, this is the how our website of listeningcoldrespect.com look like when you come on your homepage, where you find the homepage about the uh, inclusive pro, uh, project and many more. You will find more guidelines on, on this website and on this page. So, uh, we come up with principles on uh, of listening group respect. So we have belief in inclusion as inclusion international. We believe that inclusion is, is very important. Uh, we have creating opportunities for self advocates, uh, leaders, to make sure that they are part of organizations, part of uh, programs, and uh, they are. Uh, they are they are involved in uh, everyday work, uh, building awareness and understanding, make sure people understand how to include and work with people with disabilities. Uh, we have communication, uh, communicating in an accessible way that is to make information easy to lead, easy to understand. And also we have providing reasonable accommodation when we are working, when uh, when we are working or involving people with intellectual disability, we need to understand the uh, the accommodation that they need. Uh, value the process is also very important to check when we are working with our people with intellectual disability. Using the convention of the last of person with disabilities is another tool that we use to make sure that when we, we more, have more understanding when we are working with uh, people with intellectual disability. And lastly, we have understand that inclusion is a process with the journey. We cannot just reach there one by one, but it's a process of learning which the people are coming to understand what it means to be in, to have inclusion in our society, in our organization, and in our programs. Next. Now, how do we use listening include respect in production and analysis work? We worked with the IRC to help them to use listening code respect guidelines and to make protection analysis framework document more accessible and to understand how to work with the organization of people with disabilities. We use the listening code respect guideline to help to make sure that the meetings are run exclusively so that everyone can take part 
help the group to understand what accessible information is for is for people with intellectual disabilities review the protection analysis framework documents to make sure they are easy and more useful and also we create more standalone tools based on the guidelines a video and how to check list angelic can share this with you next Now, why should everyone include included in protection work? Protection analysis must be included everyone. By understanding inclusion and accessibility for people with disabilities, you can assure that people who are generally excluded are included in the in your work. When organize marginalized people are part of your work. You learn more about situation. This will help you to see the whole picture. Next. Now, what what do things what good things happen in protection and analysis when we when you uh work when we are inclusive and accessible? It helps people to understand and be part of work, working on the protection. Involving marginalized people means we get better information. We can understand least challenges we may not have know about before. We can make, uh, make better plans that work for more people. When the people feel understood and listened to, they will trust you more. They will help and take part in your work. Now, why is it including organization people with, uh, people with disabilities important? Organization of people with disabilities add value to the work of humanitarian organizations. Organization of people with disabilities are part of the community and understand how to work with people. With people, we understand about inclusion and accessibility. We can make sure people who are generally excluded be contribute and be part of your work. Local organizations of people with disabilities can guide humanitarian organization to make sure you work in good reaches people and, and response to what people need. Local organization can do long term relationship and keep your work going. Now, working in partnership. Including on international, I've been working with IRC on several op projects. Support them in work with our members and including people with intellectual disability in their activities. To help us create in this training, IRC has served a humanitarian organization and we have consulted with members to find out about their experiences. We have been creating training for members and humanitarian organizations. Now, on the map, I will share what we find out from our members about how to work better with, better, better with. We talked to 17 participants from 14 members organizational across the global network about the experience. So you can see on the map, it's shown our members that we have worked on and do the service and uh, conversions. Now, recommendations, message to humanitarian organization. We ask the members for their communication recommendations and the message for humanitarian organizations 
Our member says they need better understanding of intellectual disabilities. Humanitarian organizations should use the software to develop the by local organization of people with a disability to increase this understanding. Organization of people with a disability must be included from a very start in the planning activities. Do not wait until the end and try to make project disability ex exclusive, inclusive. This will not be effective. Effective. Additionally, humanitarian organizations need to review how they measure success when working with OPDs. The current approach does not look at, at the impact. The numbers may not show the full value of expertise OPDs provide. Next. Can you hear me? Yes, Mark. Yes, Mark. I have moved the presentation to the next slide. Ah, oh, okay. It's my network. Thank you. Now, um, the condition again suggesting training for humanitarian organization. Our members went training for humanitarian organization on uh, on how properly work with organization of people with disability is important. And the training should cover building awareness of intellectual disabilities and how to work inclusively for for example, using guidelines like listen, including this space. Next. Uh, recommendation, what organization of people with disability need? Finally, our members, they decide they need training and support to strengthen their organization so they can continue their work. They want to share experiences with their organization, working in the humanitarian partnership. Having this peer support is important. They also want to understand the workings of the large humanitarian organization. They think both types of organization need to understand how each other works. This is a very important for good collaboration. Next. Now, uh, some important steps to know when working on protection work. Follow the living in good list principle. Plan, uh, plan all the work to be disability inclusive from the start. It is much easier and less expensive than adding and doing things later. Evolving new organizations talk to different groups of people and uh, and good people who most often get left out. Uh, make it easier. Uh, make it easier to join in. Use simple language. Uh, provide information in different ways, like pictures or audio. Put meetings in the place everyone can get into. And also. I uh, use different ways to get information, like doing, don't just use written survey, say a group talk, drawing, or story uh, telling. Now, some important steps when, uh, steps to know when working on protection work. Uh, we have training the staff, teach workers how to talk 
to divalence group. Help them understand why including everyone is important. Keep the information carefully. Make sure you understand what divalence group are saying and look for patterns in what people are telling you. Yes, yeah, that what is you, at two. Yeah. yeah, what you learn in simple ways, use, use clear, easy language to tell people what you find out. Make a report that is easy to read and understand. Ask yourself why it cannot be easy for much. Most people prefer this. Uh, use pictures, simple chat, and or stories to explain this. Ask people feedback. Tell if people understand what you are saying. See if they think you got things right. And uh, be people updated. Tell people what you are doing with the information. Let them know how their ideas have been used. And the main make your communication recommendation clear, explain how your idea will help the balance group, show how you listen to what people said. And rather be open to change. Be ready to change your plans if people give you new ideas. And uh, that's right. Thank you very much. Uh, that is all I have. You can contact me through my email, and also you can check on listening to this uh, website and uh, learn more about the guidelines. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thank you. That was great. Uh, I will share uh, all the resources and the guidelines on the site with you all. Um, I saw a couple of hands. Do you have any questions? Okay. I see a lot of clapping. So thanks a lot for your uh, for your positive feedback. Um, Mark, thank you. Thanks, Kimber, for sharing the contacts. OK. Um, yes, Dennis, is, is there is this a hand? Do you have any questions? Yes, uh, many thanks. Uh, for sharing the first presentation and also for the second presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question. I don't know if this is the right time to ask. Is this specific to listen include respect guidelines? No, this is with regard to the first presentation that was shared. Okay. Then maybe I would suggest that we keep all questions uh, for the Q&A session just because I would like to give the floor to colleagues from South Sudan to present on their experience. If there is something specific to listen and include respect, maybe we can raise it now. Henry? Uh, yes, 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 hello. Thank you, Anita. Uh, thanks also, Mark, for the presentation. It was lovely. Uh, I only have one question from the perspective of uh, from here, South Sudan. Like, uh, what what are the, the, the intrinsic challenges that people are facing there, <clears throat> dealing with people of uh, disability? Because uh, awareness is always a key. So, apart from that, what are the challenges that you guys are facing, and and and, and how are you guys dealing with it? So, if, if, so, if there's anything that we can learn to deal up with here. Uh, I don't mind. The natives have. Them. Thanks, no, no. thanks a lot, Henry. I think that this is a. This is a great way to move to our new, next presentation, which is specific to South Sudan uh, and good examples oh. of engaging local organizations and organizations of people with disabilities. So I will give the floor to David and Addis, who both have extensive experience um, with local engagement and um, engaging organizations of people with disabilities. So over to you, David and Addis. 
Thank you. Um, just to confirm, can you hear me, colleagues? We can. We can hear you. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Um, thank you, Angeliki, yes, and thank you very much, uh, Mark, for that presentation. It was really quite insightful. Um, so my name is David Hattar. I'm the Protection Cluster Coordinator for South Sudan, um, and I think uh, we we're here to kind of uh, talk a little bit about the experience that we had. Um, when we were drafting our protection anal uh, analysis update back in July, I think, of 2023. Um, so you all know the path and you all know the POW, um, and this is something that we're supposed to be on, a, uh, we're supposed to produce on a quarterly basis. Um, and for that particular period, um, it was, uh, for us, we were, we were getting all of these questions, right, from, from donors, from partners, all of that. Um, so just to to take you through the through the process and how it went uh, and how it became. Um, so what did we know at the time? Uh, we know globally that people with disabilities and elderly are often among the most vulnerable in humanitarian crisis. Um, we also know that during a humanitarian crisis, people with disabilities are often excluded from relief, from relief efforts. Um, and then we were also getting increased reports um, that um, in cases of active conflict, people with disabilities and the elderly were usually being left behind. So this is, this is, these were reports that we were receiving from, from our colleagues in the field uh, saying that this is uh, like a very big concern for everyone. Um, and as if you don't know, uh, South Sudan has had the protection monitoring system up and running since October 2022. So back in that time, I, I went back and checked back at the time, uh, some of the biggest um, protection risks that we had according to our protection monitoring system was civil documentation, lack of access to humanitarian assistance, family separation, uh, and gender-based violence. Uh, next slide, please. So that's what we knew. Um, and then when we tried to look into it, we tried to, you know, do our secondary data review. Um, we realized that there is a big gap when we talk about census or data, specifically on people with disabilities, which was making it quite difficult for us to plan. Uh, in fact, I think unt um, until then, the most recent census that we had was from 2008, and it reportedly said that um, there's only 5% of the population of South Sudan that uh, were living with a disability. What we also knew, and I think everyone knows this, that uh, South Sudan unfortunately suffers from sporadic conflicts here and there. Um, and by default, we know that from a conflict, there are a couple of things that happen that, by, that would um, increase the number of uh, people that could have a disability. So we know that it increase, uh, increases incidence of injury. We know that uh, conflict disrupts healthcare services. been uh, like uh, preventable. We know that uh, there is a very big psychological impact, including PTSD and other mental conditions that could be debilitating in, in conflict zones. And then when we were doing our review as well, we, we noticed that there, was, um, there wasn't enough sufficient online information on people with disabilities in South Sudan. So if you go online, you would probably find your usual um, like um, publication from IOM, uh, Humanity and Inclusion, um, Christian Blind Mission, um, and, and a couple other more, but I don't think it was like sufficient for us to say, you know, we can, we can build a POW on it. Um, and then we also had Humanity and Inclusion had reached out to us to tell us about their Leave No One Behind project, uh, which is basically a series of project or a project with um, a series of projects that focus on mainstreaming disability and humanitarian action through capacity building, research and awareness raising. So in a way, the stars aligned, right? And we were like, okay, humanity and inclusion, we need to have a talk. And we agreed that part of part as a result of this project or as part of this project, we would get together and we would involve them in the drafting of the POW. What happened? Uh, did you move to the next slide, Angeliki, please? Yeah, perfect, thank you. So we met with uh, with HI several times, and they they liked the idea. We liked the idea, and then we started talking and, and trying to understand how how we would go about this. Right now, we hadn't done this previously. Uh, previously, a POW, the way we drafted our POWs was we would draft something, we would send it to the AORs or people in the field, and maybe some donor or something for them to give us feedback, and then we would publish it. 
Um, but however, given the big gap in information that was available, um, that was not that was not going to work. Um, so with with HI, we decided that maybe it would be a good idea if we come up with some sort of specialized group um, that we could then rely on them to um, provide us with like a lot of localized information that we were um, that we were missing. Um, so when we sat down with HI, we said that we would ideally want it to be a very comprehensive task force. So with HI, we agreed that it should be, of course, HI, the protection cluster, uh, organizations of persons with disabilities, UN agencies are welcomed, INGOs, NGOs, uh, even community members representing, you know, people with disabilities were welcomed. Um, and then we also decided, so we had our first meeting. Uh, it was quite interesting, to be honest, because we were being very inclusive uh, in the disability front. However, in the gender front, we were quite <laughs> the contrary. There was not a single female in the room. Um, and I think we all we all used that as a joke that day. We were like, OK, we're finally being a little bit inclusive, but failing in the other front. Uh, we were very clear from the beginning that um, we wanted to shift the way we work. We didn't want it to be like we've been doing the pause, whereas like we draft or we take the information from them, we draft, do the analysis, and then give them feedback. No, we wanted them to be very, very involved in the entire process. They were very happy to hear this. They were very, they told us themselves that this is something that always happens. You come for information, but don't include us. So we were like, we're more than happy. In fact, it divides the work. So logically, for me, it makes sense. And I think for HI as well. Um, so we then decided on the roles and, and responsibilities, like we said, everyone is involved. It's not something that is led by the cluster, but rather by the entire task force. Um, and then we also discussed about the types and regularity of meetings. Um, so we had agreed that we would have regular meetings. I think at the time it was bi-weekly, but after a while and with the deadline approaching, we started having it weekly and sometimes even more than once a week. Um, and then we also, because a lot of them are from, a lot of the colleagues that were part of the task force were part of, of uh, grassroots uh, organizations. And like I said, some of them were even like community members. Uh, we felt that it would be prudent for us to give them like a crash course or an induction on the path, because ultimately we would be using the path for, for, this, for this assessment or for this uh, product. Um, so we did the induction, I think, with the, with the support of the GPC, which was very helpful. Uh, we did it for like, I think, two or three sessions. We had the GPC there telling us how the path works and everything. Um, and then we had agreed that we would not do it online, but rather when we, whenever we meet, it would be best if we meet in person. Uh, for for three reasons. One is um, internet connectivity in South Sudan is is a little bit shaky. Two, uh, we've all been in online meetings and sometimes, you know, if it's a very long meeting, you drift away and it, it would be counterproductive. And then all, there was also like the problem of resources. Some colleagues did not have uh, laptops, um, others did not have offices, therefore had no internet. Um, so a way, that for, a way for us to overcome this was that when we suggested that we would have these working sessions, um, we would book the UNHCR um, conference room, provide internet for everyone, and we even managed to get the ICT unit to lend us a couple of laptops that we were able to give to the colleagues for them to work. Uh, and I think that was actually very, very helpful, to be honest. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, because a lot of colleagues did not have internet or laptops, we would then just like schedule the conference room for like two, three hours, four hours, and we'd have working sessions where we would all be sitting there and typing and discussing. Um, and then we also discussed the timeframes and objectives. Um, timeframes were set, objectives, however, of course, when you have that many people working on something, deadlines are always going to be missed. Um, and I think you'll see it in my in my coming slides that uh, that's one of the things that if you are planning on doing this, you need to be very relaxed with missing deadlines because otherwise you will be very, very stressed. Um, and we also looked at the way of working because we wanted everyone to be involved. If you see the power, there are very, uh, like a lot of sections. And I think at the time we were like maybe 15 or 20 people. So we decided to be to split into groups and each group would work on one section. However, because we wanted everyone to be part and everyone to see it and like put their comments, 
then we would rotate. So we would say, for example, today is Tuesday. By Thursday, you're supposed to finish this section. And then whoever was working on this section, we rotate and you review. Uh, that way, we made sure that everyone actually wrote something in the document. Um, next slide, please. Yes, um, basically. So that was the story on how we did it. I think personally, it was quite successful. Um, it definitely elevated disability inclusion across South Sudan. Um, the colleagues, um, we were they were able to participate. They were able to give their honest opinions. If you look at all of the POWs that South Sudan uh, has produced, that one, you would feel that it's more of a personal touch because we have quotes, we have personal experiences and so forth simply because obviously it was the first time that we do the task force, but also the fact that we didn't have so much data. So we felt like, yes, okay, so if we need to put a quote uh, from a community member, then we will put it. Um, so it does really have that personal touch. Um, so we were able also to elevate disability inclusion. In, in South Sudan, we have a group called the Gender, Gender and Inclusion Task Team, which is supposed to look at all, of, at all inclusion, not just gender. Uh, we made sure that uh, disability is now part of it. Uh, the colleagues from, from HI attend and also some other uh, participants from the task force. Uh, we've been able to make sure that there is dis disability inclusion considerations in programming. So for example, um, the South Sudan Humanitarian Fund. That means that whenever you're writing a proposal for the Humanitarian Fund, which is a pooled fund, there will be questions on whether there is programming for uh, disability inclusion. Are you targeting people with disabilities? How are you doing it? And so forth. Uh, donors were very happy with this because they hadn't seen anything before. And we got donors to start uh, asking questions. So the Dutch, for example, all of a sudden were reaching out and saying, OK, what's happening with disability inclusion? Uh, they even did a mission to South Sudan. and. Um, the representative of, of the embassy was very interested in the work that, be, that was being done, not by us, but by like anyone that's working in disability inclusion. And I think now they're even funding certain people that are working in disability inclusion. Um, so another success was that, like I mentioned, we were able to have access to very like grassroots and local information, which is quite visible in the POW in, in the form of, you know, when we were um, analyzing, for example, certain um, activities or cer certain norms that happen, you'll see that some of the explanation is very grassroots as to, like, to the fact that someone says, in my in my payam, in my village, this is why this happens because this is the belief about people with disabilities, for example. So that was very very useful for us. Uh, we were able to build the capacity of the task force on the path, on analysis, and on pow which is always a good thing. Uh, we were able to establish a network, uh, a very good network, to be honest. And I think we're still all some, sometimes not directly in touch, but through other uh, initiatives. And it was very interesting for me, to be honest, and you'll see it in my next slide, that we had a lot of different opinions due to uh, a large number of participants. So this is a good thing in my, this was a success, but also in my opinion, a challenge because Obviously, when you're doing an analysis, the more the more opinions that you have, the better, right? But also, the more opinions that you have and that you have to compile and try to like, you know, in a professional manner, try to like figure out what it is that we're which direction we're going to go. The longer the process it takes. So, with that said, if we could go to the next slide, please. Deadlines will be missed. <laughs> there is no there is no way around it. Uh, I am personally myself someone that is terrible with deadlines as it is, so this did not help. Uh, but definitely the fact that we had all of these constraints, whether it's internet, whether it's uh, like resources, it was it was definitely something like an eye-opening experience for us. Um, because we were doing these work sessions from UNHCR, uh, uh, some of the colleagues that came from like uh, CBOs or grassroots NGOs didn't. It was very difficult for them to like pay for transportation um, several times. So we had to, with the help of HI and sometimes ourselves, um, like I said, we provided laptops, internet, and uh, office space for them to work or like the conference room. Um, then gender imbalance was was a big issue at the beginning uh, until we all started joking about it and we finally managed to get a couple of colleagues that were invested in this work to attend. 
Um, and I think that definitely gave it a very interesting touch to the POW. If you if you look at it, you'll definitely see that there, like had had we not had female colleagues, there is definitely certain aspects, especially when we're talking about GBV and so forth, that would not have been um, as detailed or as informative. And like I said, different opinions, large number of participants. This is also going to be a challenge, but you always want to aim to have more people um, to, to have like a better analysis. But obviously, like I said, more people equals more time that you're going to need to. Um, next slide. So this is the picture we took in the, our first session. As you can see, we had one colleague that was joining us from Jordan or Syria on, on the screen. <laughs> the rest of us uh, were uh, males. Uh, and unfortunately, when we did uh, include, like when, when female colleagues did join, um, we did not take a picture. So that's, that's also like proof that we need to do better when it comes to that, to like uh, document that. Um, that's that's all from my side, to be honest. This is how the process went. If you have any comments, any questions, please feel free. Uh, I'm more than happy to to shed more light. Um, my next slide is, if you can share it, Angeliki, please. Uh, it's a couple of uh, links that I think might be useful for some of you. Uh, if you want to see like the reports and updates and assessment that we've done in the cluster, you can click on the second link. If you want to see our five Ws, you can click on the third our protection monitoring system on the last one. And if you want to be a, a member of the protection cluster mailing list is the first link. And if you want to reach out to me, that's also my my Gmail, my email. Uh, and yeah, uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, David. Thank you. Um, I see a couple of hands. Um, is there any question for David? Henry, is this a hand from before or do you have a question? Uh, no, unfortunately not. Uh, but thank you guys. Yeah, it's been cooperative. Yeah. Amina, over to you. Do, you. do you have questions for David? Um, yes. Hello. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Uh, thank you so much, David. This is really very interesting and very useful. Um, this is Amina from the Protection Cluster in uh, Palestine. Um, I, I was. Um, it's really interesting uh, when you uh, uh, briefed about the uh, inclusion um, working group or task force. I'm sorry, I, I, I couldn't like recognize if it's a task force or working group. Um, and uh, yeah, it's very important to have all of these uh, cross-cutting themes together rather than having disability and gender and elderly, each one aside or separated from each others. My question is, um, was this working group um, um, run by the protection cluster? or it was at like intersectoral uh, uh, level. Uh, is it only for the protection cluster partners to mainstream uh, cross-cutting themes and ensure inclusive response? Or it was also to promote outside the uh, protection uh, cluster and uh, protection response? Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Amina. That's a very good question. So first, first to answer, it's not a working group. It was a task force that we established specifically for the POW. Um, to be honest, uh, working with HI, we did not specifically mention that they need to be protection partners. In fact, like I mentioned, some of some of the participants were not even, you know, like working in the sector. They were part of the communities. Um, I will say most of them do work specifically like within a certain aspect with protection, but I'm pretty sure that most of them had other sectoral um, expertise as well. But to be fair, no, we did not specifically uh, ask for protection and we did not specifically say we would open it up uh, to anyone. Um, so it was run by us, yes. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much, thanks. 
Perfect. Unless we have other questions, I would like to move with our next presenter, Addis. Oh, Dennis, I see your hand. No, not anymore. Okay, let's move on with our final presenter and then we will have a dedicated session questions and answers. I would like to apologize in advance because we will go beyond the scheduled time. So I hope that's fine with you colleagues. Um, we will try to to finish at a uh, uh, quarter to the hour. So add this over to you. Um. Uh, thank you, Angeliki and uh, the colleagues for the presentation. And uh, my name is Addis Victor. Uh, I work as executive director for access for social inclusion. And uh, through your request, Angeliki, I would try to squeeze my time to allow my colleague from HI to put some input in my presentation later, which is very important because it has been our commenter to do with inclusion. So I will try to squeeze from my minutes so that I can also give my colleague John Kimani from Humanity and Inclusion to give some few inputs regarding uh, this power and the power for work. Uh, this is uh, access for social inclusion, being a disability-led organization, aimed to advocate for the rights of women, men, and uh, boys with disability. It's a group that has been uh, like uh, neglected and disregarded for their uh, full participation. So, ASI is working uh, implementing programs in South Sudan, especially in Yei, Morobo, and Juba, providing inclusive technical support to other organizations and of persons with disability. We also ensure working with the community-led organizations and the volunteers to run out if it is so inclusive, but due to lack of resources. Let's go to the next slide. So ASEA has participated so much in uh, power and power, and uh, the reason being uh, as, a, as a disability organization, we provide a better understanding on the protective environment based on the context. It also gives us uh, opportunity to describe priorities of risks that affect people with the vulnerable, I mean, uh, vulnerable communities. Uh, in also, it gives us uh, the understanding on uh, existing capacity and build on those to ensure sustainability and long-term impact. So these are some of the contributions, the opportunities that uh, as organization of person with disability, providing during the path and the power uh, development. Next. We're able to go through uh, this uh, exercise because of the involvement of persons with disability and their representative organizations. Just David has just uh, emphasized mostly, this has worked possibly because of the involvement and all the engagement of persons with disability and their organizations. Also, it made this possible because uh, there were some guidelines that gives humanitarian actors or protection classes the mandate to include persons with disability, especially the, the presence of the UNCRPD and the AIC guidelines on uh, inclusion of persons with disability. So these tools were able to make it possible for the participation of persons with disability and their representative organizations. Also, uh, Protection partners uh, are able to recognize and acknowledge the role of OPDs in identifying uh, gaps and the capacity. Also, the establishment of network uh, as local partners also able to make it uh, to engage uh, uh, organizations of persons with disability in protection uh, programming and analysis. Like I said, uh, organizations like uh, HI and the South Sudan Protection Cluster were able to establish uh, this network to engage these organizations of persons with disability in South Sudan. And uh, I happen to be one of the participants in the development of the POW up to the end. So again, working closely with the Mantara organizations and class system to ensure meaningful engagement of persons with disability and their representative in these analysis processes. So OPDs are able to contextualize knowledge and experience uh, of of uh, organizations in understanding some of the unique risks facing particular groups in the form of uh, this uh, of of exclusion. Like uh, Pete, uh, David said, 
uh, these organizations for persons with disability or the presence of persons with disability in the power development were able to to highlight the the most vulnerable or the risk factors that are faced by persons with disability. Next. So in our participation, in our engagement, we have identified some gaps or challenges that are still present. Uh, like, uh, like recently, South Sudan has signed uh, the UN Convention, and uh, but still few discussions uh, uh, around uh, disabilities still there. So basically, people don't talk much about disability in so many uh, various clusters or in in the country. So even some of the uh, case management documents does not capture disability in their bio data. So this is still remain a gap and there is still a challenge. So absence of active coordination mechanism also to address issues around disability still remain a gap and still a challenge. So in the system, uh, current management do not capture bio data. Like I said, most of our bio data only captures the, the gender and the, the the person in party, but uh, things to do regarding uh, disabilities not captured, even the types of disabilities are not captured in the system. So there's a longer process to convince various level of protection leadership to learn uh, also or to adapt in inclusion discussion. So this is still remain a gap which we still identify and we still push together with humanitarian inclusion to ensure that most of our tools uh, capture uh, information on disability. Also, there are still few resources. There are few social workers on disabi uh, with disabilities. Most social workers are persons with a disability. So we are still looking at it as a gap. And uh, they see decreased or no funding, especially for disability inclusion and rehabilitation. So we find that most uh, funding just is specific on a particular type of uh, uh, concern or risk, but uh, to do specific on disability inclusion and rehabilitation remains a challenge or a gap. So absence of data still continues to be a gap in, in regards to resources. Uh, David has talked a lot about it, and I'm so just emphasizing on that. So understanding there is still underestimation of OPDs in regarding uh, capacity. So most organizations of persons with disability are not funded. They are either supported just to implement an, an activity indirectly. But to give direct funding to organizations of persons with disabilities still remain a gap simply because there is still underestimation or people have still a misconception or knowledge that persons with disability can still manage an organization. So that's why you find most organizations for persons with disability lack funding gap. So these are some of the gaps that we have still identify and it still remain as a, as a challenge. So what can we do as a way forward? We still encourage organizations uh, to involve organizations with with disability because they provide advocacy, they provide guidance, and the technical assistance from a life experience. And again, we push uh, for the involvement of organizations of persons with disability because they allow cross-cutting learning between local and inter international humanitarian actors. Again, this organization provides support continuity of action as they remain still on crisis and even after crisis. This organization, local organizations remain there even before and after crisis. So that's why we encourage uh, support for these organizations. Under our partnership, we still encourage uh, protection classes to work with uh, organizations of persons with disability to realize adaptation of this path and also to review documents. One of the important uh, to review documents is that uh, working closely with humanitarian inclusion under this Leave No One Behind project is a, is a tool mapping, which John Kimani will put a little bit uh, emphasis on it to understand it better. Also, we continue to lobby for fundraising together to specify services for persons with disability in order to reduce barriers to increase in independency. So we also encourage uh, strengthening of both 
uh, state and national actors to include persons with disability in their reporting mechanism. Next. So this is one of our presentation. You can see me there doing a presentation on the tool regarding disaggregation of data. Thank you very much. And I want to give my little time to John Kimani to put some input regarding the tool mapping, how possible it's going to work. Thanks a lot, Adis and David. Uh, we can now hear from other colleagues. And yes, please feel free to share additional information on the on the tool. Okay. Um, is there any additional information with regards to the tool that was developed on disaggregated data uh, from uh, humanity and inclusion? Uh, John seems not to be online, but uh, this we're looking at a tool mapping where we're looking at the assessment tools, uh, case management tools, uh, to look at it, that most of this data, so that, I mean, most of, most of these tools to capture information on disability because uh, we, want to, we want to look not only on the number of persons with disability, it is important also to, know, to, know, to look at the barriers and the possible risks that are encountered by persons with disability and they also to identify and acknowledge their ability and in regards to their capacity. So these are some of the things that are captured in the group. So it is still uh, a work that is on process uh, that in regards to this disaggregation of data. Thank you. Thanks so much, Adis. Um, colleagues, I would like to open the Q&A session. So I know that you had a few questions that you would like to share with us before. Feel free to raise your hands and we're going to um, dedicate the next 10 to 15 minutes on questions and answers. I see already some comments in the chat. I will share all the slides and the presentations and our contacts with you and also the resources that have been mentioned by colleagues. They will all be available um, to all of you. So over to you for reflections, comments, um, challenges, additional challenges that you would like to share, but also ideas on how we can work together to create inclusive and accessible sp spaces when it comes to protection analysis and how we can encourage uh, active involvement of local organizations in the protection analysis process. Either the session was uh, too informative and there are no questions or you have fallen asleep. I hope it's the first. Great. I see some positive feedback and people haven't fallen asleep. Uh, I'm glad I see some hands raised. Henry, I still see your hand, but I guess it's from before. Angeliki, there are a couple of questions on the chat. I don't know if you're seeing this. Um, yes. So let's start with the chat and then we will go to colleagues who raise their hands. Are there child-friendly tools specifically for children living with children, right? Uh, I can, can I answer, answer that one? Yes, please go ahead at this. And I have like very few thoughts, but uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I think, okay, for South Sudan, uh, 
humanitarian inclusion in partnership with the Save the Children, I think they are working on uh, that docu that tool. Yes, I can say it is there for child protection. So that tool is there, but uh, humanitarian inclusion and the, the, the other, and they Save the Children, they are working to revise it so that to make it more disability inclusive. Thanks, Addis. Will you be able to share that with, uh, with the group as well, together with the rest of the resources? Sure, sure. Perfect. Okay, it's not always easy to involve local partners in activities. How did you go about achieving this? So I will, I will like, um, yeah, answer this question from like the IRC side, but obviously other colleagues can contribute. So indeed, it's not always easy to involve local partners, but uh, I think what's important is to um, look at the objectives of your activity. So given that in protection work, what we aim is to reduce risks affecting communities, I think it is important to make space, plan in advance, design uh, in advance what you want to achieve and how you want to achieve it and involve local actors since the very beginning and civil society organizations. So there are different ways to, to engage local partners, but from our experience, the most important part is to really um, uh, engage local organizations uh, at the very, very beginning of any process you want to undertake and give them space, time and resources uh, to meaningfully contribute. Whether this is protection analysis to better understand the environment, the risks, the challenges, but also what are the available capacities uh, or to engage them in the delivery of prevention and response activities. I think it's it's very important to identify which of the local actors um, are willing and they have the bandwidth and they want to engage. What do they need for meaningful engagement and how they can actually support the analysis process and the design of the of the response. Um, I will give the David, would you like to answer to this question? Hi, yes, you... I just want I just wanted to pick it back on what you said. I think I agree with everything you just said, but I think um, colleagues, I think it's also time that we start being like true um, and and be like real with with what we mean when we say inclusion. Uh, mm -hmm. Inclusion is deciding to dedicate uh, a certain amount of funds so that you can, so that you are able to support those who are unable to come unless you support them financially. We cannot just keep going and saying, "Oh, let's include, let's include, let's include," when we're not advocating, for example, with donors to have like certain specific funds for people working with disabilities. We cannot say let's include when we ourselves are doing all of these projects and we're not like allocating certain funds to like disability inclusion. So I think to answer the colleague who asked the question, definitely it was not, it was not easy. Um, it was easier than, than you would think, to be honest, because there is always this appetite, yes? Um, organizations working with people with disabilities, NGOs working with people with disabilities will always have the appetite to be included. However, the, the challenge always will remain um, the resources. So I think, from that from that aspect of how to get them together, it was very very easy. It all it took was one email, and all of a sudden I had like seven eight people in the, in the conference room, which was very easy. I think the most difficult part was the the resource allocation, which I think needs to come from within, needs to come from us, and say that right. So we know that we want to do this. We need to have some sort of little fund allocated or big fund allocated, depending on what you you're planning to do. I hope this helps. Thank you over. Thanks, David. Uh, I think, uh, Gabriel, you're next. Gabriel, do you have a question? Both Gabriel. Okay, maybe I will go back to the chat. Um, Natalie is asking if there are good practices of local partners being included in designing tools. 
Uh, I can briefly share the experience from IRC. So we established the local advisory group. So we had an extensive process of outreach to identify local partners and local actors who were interested to be engaged in the designing of the resources. Um, and then we had dedicated funding. David uh, flagged that this is very important and we did have dedicated funding to compensate for their time and their expertise. And we worked together um, for a period of six months. We had more than eight uh, sessions. We worked in uh, uh, groups and in plenary, and we adapted the PATH tools and resources. Um, and I can share more information on how that worked. Um, but yes, it was, it was quite important um, to have dedicated resources to have interpretation available and to collect inputs through various communication channels, online, offline, bilaterally, in group sessions, um, in smaller sessions in order to finalize the resources. I don't know if other colleagues have experience with development of uh, tools. Um, I could add maybe from our side, I think very similar to what you said. Um, we've, I think now for the past year, year, year and a half, we've grown into the habit of we will share it with everyone and everyone just give me your feedback. Again, I think this requires a lot of like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> this requires a lot of you understanding that this is going to take way much more of your time but then we need to think about it in the long run, right? So I said it when, when I was presenting about the, the POW task force, we knew it was gonna take longer than expected. To give, you, to give you an idea, we started drafting the POW in June, um, and usually a POW will take, what, three, four, five weeks maximum, like a month. We started drafting in June, we published in October. So, Obviously, it takes a lot of time. So another practice that we that we're doing here now a lot is whenever we want to design some, whenever we're coming up with a strategy, whenever we're designing any tools or everything, uh, we send an online, we send an email, uh, an expression of interest. So we say, dear colleagues, we're working on one, two, three. Uh, we're looking for someone to look at this, be very critical, tell us what we're doing wrong or right, and then people just come in. Um, depending on what, what it is that you're developing, it could be face-to-face -face or it could be online. And I think it's, it's if I, I'm, of course, my opinion is biased, but I think we're doing quite okay with, with like the inclusion of colleagues. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, I see a question specific to Disability, so are people living with albinism considered people living with disabilities or under what categorization do they fall? Uh, I'm not an expert in disability, so if any colleague has the answer to that question, please feel free to share. Yeah, thank you. Let me answer a little bit. Hello, you're getting me? Yes, I'll just go ahead. Yeah, I think discussions are on, on about uh, people with albinism, but for now, yeah, it had been categorized that persons with albinism are also part of persons with disability because they experience, they're also experiencing discrimination and uh, as a marginalized group. So they are also part of the uh, disab disability. So, because part of them also are experiencing multiple disability, especially the, when they experience when it comes to sight, visually, and uh, other challenges. So, it has been categorized persons with, I mean, uh, persons with albinism are, yes, they are persons with disability because they are part of the minority group that experience uh, discrimination. Thank you, Addis. And I think there is uh, one more question with like similar 
Similar question. So are people living with NTDs like elephantiasis considered living with disability? Uh, some some of these disabilities are as a result of medical condition. Uh, the elephantiasis, this is as a result of medical condition. But uh, the, what is disability generally? We are looking at uh, whether there are some challenges uh, as a result of that medical condition that obstruct this person from fully participating. But if the person is participating at an equal basis, so we cannot for now categorize as persons with disability. This is how I can look at it. Unless uh, the, this medical condition has resulted into a major thing that are obstructing this person from participating. So any challenge as a result of that medical condition could be a situation of disability. Thanks a lot, Addis. Um, do we have any other questions? I see some hands coming and going. Yes, David, over to you. This is me, Jada Michael. Uh, I've joined Hi, the Michael. meeting late. Yeah, thank you for giving me this chance. Uh, for me, just I want to talk on uh, especially sustainability for those people with a disability. Even though we are we are discussing on people with, living with a disability, there's a disability which is physically and emotionally, and uh, you, you may find that the partners are doing the project, but uh, they don't have such a sustainability, which is not even uh, encourageable for those people who are living with SIV, I mean uh, disability. Uh, uh, after doing the project, uh, after running the project, then uh, when the project is stopped, there's no any sustainability. That is why it, it may discourage people living with a disability in uh, areas where they are in their location, I mean. Uh, for example, even uh, this, uh, like uh, SIV, people living with the SIV, those are emotionally, and they are discriminated in a, uh, in the community even, uh, to go and get their treatment in the health facility. Uh, at times they will not go, or even they will neglect those people. They will even, they may see those people are watching at them, what that, what is happening. Because uh, once people know you in the area that you have a SIV, then uh, people may start, uh, they have a mentality that even though eating together, they will not, uh, they will start backbiting you, you Many things is happening. Huh? Which means for us to develop that uh, sustainability, uh, uh, to maintain the project, that the sustainability of that project should be there. Uh, the sustainability is the first priority. Huh? There's what is called maybe a, a project asset and NGO's asset. After finishing that project, then maybe this uh, project asset will be added maybe to those of uh, church people or community leaders so that to maintain the, what the, the people with disability in that area where the project has happened and implemented. This is not uh, my just comment on uh, what people have been discussing. As I heard where people, they, they talk of uh, uh, like people who are living with disability and people who are discriminated in the uh, in the communities, uh, this is my response. Just thank you. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. Thanks for the comments. Do we have yeah, uh, uh, other questions? Yes. Uh, I was highlighting something uh, based on, uh, we were talking about albinism and I wanted to put further light on what Addis Victor was saying. Uh, when it comes to albinism, uh, the factor that the fact that, uh, uh, we know albinism is always aligned to, 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 uh, things like visual impairment makes it, uh, uh a disability, but majorly when you talk about their, their disabilities based on that uh, impairment that is associated to it. So basically it cannot be a general term, but it should be based on 
which disabilities are associated to it because we have the categories of disabilities that uh, we know we work with usually so i think that should be the basis or the li the lens in which we look at this like if it's an albino what uh, what uh, what uh, impairment is actually associated to his or her albinism so I think that should be the question that we put in our mind as we deal with things like albinism and other uh, kind of stuff. Thank you. And I think that uh, Zainab from uh, um, Nigeria has also mentioned the Washington Group questions, where basically it refers exactly to what you mentioned, David. Um, really associate uh, the condition with the, um, uh, the impairment. Uh, okay, colleagues, I think that we are already uh, 20 minutes beyond the allocated time. So I would like to close the session here. If you have more questions, please feel free to share in the chat. The Mentimeter will still remain uh, accessible. So if you have any comments on how to encourage uh, local engagement, please feel free to share uh any ideas and we will reach out to you again to continue our consultations um, and make sure we encourage like collective actions when it comes to uh, local engagement and engagement of organizations groups um, of people who have been working with marginalized communities so we do envision more inclusive protection analysis process and we really want to contribute by enabling local actors to meaningfully participate. Um, I would like to thank uh, to thank you for your interest, your participation, your uh, comments, your feedback, your questions. Uh, big thanks to the GPC for giving us this opportunity to share with all, all of you and to all co-presenters. Uh, Mark, uh, thanks a lot uh, to you and to all colleagues from Inclusion International, um, David, uh, and also Addis. Thanks a lot. Uh, happy Tuesday, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.